In 1939, General Motors sent a bold message to the rail industry. The future was diesel. Their prototype FT locomotive, nicknamed the Demonstrator, traveled over 74,000 miles across 20 U.S. railroads without a single breakdown. Steam engines were still king, but they came with baggage, coal, water, and constant maintenance. The FT, it just ran. Clean, efficient, and relentless. Rail executives were stunned. This wasn't just a test. It was proof that diesel electric power could outperform steam on every front. No shoveling, no refueling stops, just pure hauling power. That 74,000 mile journey didn't just impress, it changed everything. Orders flooded in, the FT became a bestseller, and the F-Series was born. What followed was one of the greatest engineering shifts in railroad history. Steam was out, and GM was in. So, how did one sleek diesel change an entire industry? Let's rewind and see how the F-Series took over America's rails. In the late 1930s, steam engines still ruled the American railroad. Towering, hissing, and fueled by coal, they were iconic but increasingly inefficient. They needed constant maintenance, water stops, and massive support crews. Railroads knew change was coming, they just didn't know how soon. Enter General Motors. Through its Electromotive Division EMD, GM had been building smaller diesel engines for passenger trains and yard switching. But freight? That was sacred steam territory. Still, GM had a plan. Create a diesel locomotive that wasn't just a replacement but a superior, scalable solution. The result was the FT, a four-axle, 1,350-horsepower diesel-electric locomotive powered by a revolutionary 16-cylinder 567 engine. Compact, efficient, and capable of operating in AB unit sets, the FT was engineered for long-haul freight. But the rail industry was skeptical. Could diesel really outperform steam? To answer that question, GM didn't hold a press conference. They hit the rails. In 1939, they launched the FT Demonstrator Tour, sending a matched AB set over 74,000 miles across 20 U.S. railroads. It ran through deserts, over the Rockies, and in sub-zero conditions without breaking down. Crews were stunned, executives were intrigued, and accountants, they saw a path to lower costs and fewer headaches. Just as orders started rolling in, the world was thrust into World War II. Materials like steel, copper, and rubber were rationed. The U.S. government, through the War Production Board, took control of industrial output. For most locomotive builders, this meant reverting to steam engines for the war effort. But GM didn't make steam. Their expertise was diesel, and that worked in their favor. The government made a pivotal decision. EMD would be the exclusive supplier of road diesel locomotives during the war. Between 1941 and 1945, GM built over 1,000 FT units, keeping American freight moving while its competitors were sidelined. Even more important than production was the head start. While others were stuck building tanks and traditional engines, GM refined its diesel technology optimized manufacturing, and expanded its workforce. By the end of the war, GM wasn't just ahead. They were untouchable. The FT had gone from experimental risk to wartime necessity to industry standard. By the end of World War II, America was ready to move faster. Steam locomotives, once the pride of railroads, were now seen as costly, labor-heavy, and outdated. Railroads wanted speed, power, and low maintenance, and General Motors was ready to deliver it. In 1946, GM introduced the F2, a transitional model that quietly bridged the gap between wartime production and the coming diesel boom. While it kept the 1,350 horsepower 567 engine, the F2 featured a new D14 three-phase generator, D27 traction motors, and improved cabling. Enhancements that gave it smoother performance and better durability under heavy loads. Only 104 units were built, making it a short-lived model, but it laid crucial groundwork for what came next. That next step was the F3, launched in late 1945 and produced until early 1949. This is where diesel became mass market, with an upgraded 567B prime motor delivering 1,500 horsepower and a stronger, heavier frame. The F3 was tailor-made for American freight. It didn't just run, it dominated. 
Over 1,100 A units and nearly 700 B units were sold. GM's LaGrange, Illinois plant mass produced them with car-like efficiency. These units rolled out with modular construction, making parts easy to swap and repair. Their distinctive chicken wire side grills and symmetrical roof fans became rail fan favorites and spotting features for collectors. Then came the Icon. The F7, released in 1949. Visually, it looked nearly identical to the F3, but internally it was a different beast. With more refined wiring, improved controls, and greater tractive effort, up to 20% more pulling power, the F7 was GM's most successful F unit. It still used the 16-cylinder 567B, but the reliability was unmatched. From 1949 to 1953, GM sold 2,393 A units and 1,463 B units, an all-time record in American diesel locomotive history. Though it was designed for freight, many railroads use the F7 in passenger service too. Santa Fe's Super Chief, with its legendary war bonnet livery, ran F7s that became the very face of post-war luxury rail travel. The F7 wasn't just popular. It was versatile, rebuildable, and immortal. It kept working long after newer models arrived, often rebuilt into commuter and tourist units that still run today. Together, the F2, F3, and F7 turned GM from a locomotive builder into a railroad empire. By 1954, General Motors had squeezed everything it could out of the cab unit design. The F9 was the last and most refined version in the freight-focused F-Series. Underneath the familiar bulldog nose sat a newly upgraded 567C engine, pumping out 1,750 horsepower, the most of any F unit to date. It ran cooler, consumed fuel more efficiently, and benefited from internal refinements in its control systems and generator design. But the market had changed. Railroads were moving away from full-width cab units and leaning heavily into a new type of diesel, the road switcher. GM's own GP7 and GP9 featured walkways, better visibility, and were designed for both mainline hauling and yard switching. They were easier for crews to navigate, cheaper to operate, and more versatile overall. While the F7 had sold by the thousands, the F9 sold only 101 A units and 156 B units. It wasn't a failure, but it was a clear sign that the F-Series was nearing its end. Still, F9s earned their place in history. Many served long-haul freight lines, while others were rebuilt into F9PH commuter locomotives that remained active through the Amtrak era. They looked almost identical to the late F7s, with only an extra vent near the front porthole to tell them apart. The F9 was a brilliant machine, but it arrived just as the industry had moved on. As passenger rail traffic declined in the 1950s, railroads faced a challenge. How to keep passenger trains running profitably without relying on bulky, aging steam locomotives or costly E-units? GM offered a clever fix. Take the proven F-unit, stretch it, and equip it for comfort. Enter the FP7 in 1949 and the FP9 in 1954. Both were built on elongated frames, adding over four feet in length to accommodate larger boilers and extra water tanks. These were crucial for generating steam to heat passenger cars during long trips, especially in colder climates. They kept the same engines as their freight counterparts, the 567B in the FP7 and the 567C in the FP9 but were often geared for higher speeds and smoother rides. In Canada, they became staples on iconic services like the Canadian and the Supercontinental under Canadian Pacific and Canadian National. In the U.S., roads like the Milwaukee Road and Southern Railway used them for commuter and regional runs. Though only 90 FP9s were ever built, their legacy was durable. Many were rebuilt in the 1980s and 90s, with modern electrical systems and head-end power HEP, allowing them to haul modern, electrically heated cars. In a market shifting to road switchers and shrinking passenger service, the FP units were GM's final push to keep cab designs alive, and they managed to hang on far longer than expected. Then came one of the most unusual and inventive F units ever built, the FL9. Commissioned by the New Haven Railroad and produced from 1956 to 1960, the FL9 was built to solve a unique problem. Trains heading into New York City's Grand Central Terminal 
needed to switch from diesel to electric third rail power inside the tunnels. Rather than swap engines mid-route, New Haven asked GM for something new. So, GM delivered a dual-mode locomotive. The FL9 could run on its 567C diesel engine on open track and seamlessly switch to third rail electric power when entering the city. Early versions even experimented with pantograph for overhead wires. Its design was unconventional. A two-axle front truck and a three-axle rear truck gave it an unusual stance. It was longer than the FP units and instantly recognizable. Only 60 were ever built, but their impact was lasting. FL9s eliminated time-consuming locomotive swaps at New Haven, improving efficiency and timetables. They remained in service for decades with Amtrak, Metro North, and Connecticut DOT, with some operating until the 2010s. Today, several FL9s survive on tourist railroads and in museums. Quirky, but brilliant, they were a final technical flourish in the F-Series, showing that GM's cab unit creativity didn't go down quietly. It looked strange, sounded strange, and yet, it worked so well, it outlasted expectations by 50 years. The last F unit rolled off the line in 1960, but their story didn't end there. Because unlike many locomotives that disappear into scrap heaps and forgotten sightings, GM's F units found second lives. Hundreds were rebuilt, some turned into FP10s, others into F9PH commuter workhorses. Amtrak, Via Rail, and dozens of regional and tourist railroads used rebuilt F units well into the 2000s. Why? Because they were simple, modular, reliable. Parts were interchangeable, rebuild kits were common, and the legendary 567 engine? It was easy to service and still roaring on short lines today. Their competitors didn't fare as well. Alco's PA units, though gorgeous, were plagued by unreliable prime movers and tricky maintenance. Baldwin bowed out of the diesel market completely, but GM's F units just kept going. You can still spot F7s pulling tourist trains in California, FP9s serving on short runs in Canada, and preserved FT units standing proud in museums. Reminders of a time when the future of American railroading was forged by Detroit's most unexpected factory. To this day, fans flock to see them. Modelers build them in HO and N scale. Rail historians write books and documentaries about them. From a 74,000-mile trial to full-blown industry takeover, GM's F-Series redefined American railroading. More than locomotives, they were a blueprint, efficient, reliable, and built for a new era. The F-Units replaced steam with the steady hum of diesel, turning maintenance nightmares into mechanical masterpieces. Today, they live on in museums, tourist railroads, and collector's displays, Reminders of when America changed tracks for good. Got a favorite F unit memory? Drop it in the comments. And if you love stories where machines make history, like and subscribe. Because in railroads and in storytelling, nothing moves without power.